Okay, I'm not exactly sure where we left off last time. I know it was that Hebrews 3, 17 to 19, but I don't know how far I got. I guess I can just run through the whole thing again real quick. Oh, yeah, that's right, because we're going to do a book Concord. That's right. All right, so Hebrews 3, uh, verses 7 to 19. I'm not going to read all of them again. Uh, but I'll read 12 to 19. Because the first part's a quote of uh, Psalm 95, and we'll listen to Psalm 95 again too. So Hebrews 3, 12, take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end, as it is said, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. So this whole section is cautioning us about unbelief. Unbelief about what? What we read in the previous uh, verses of uh, the preacher reiterating who Jesus is as the Son of God, uh, as the Christ, uh, referring to his messianic title, not his kingly title, as the anointed one of God, and how he is also our brother and our great high priest. So the preacher is kind of summarizing that right here. And then he quotes this long section from Psalm 95, which we did read last week, so I won't read the whole thing again. Uh, but Psalm 95, we'll talk about again, so I'm not going to read it again. We'll, we'll be reading it again in the next chapter because it's going to, the next chapter is going to continue to refer to that psalm because that psalm, along with uh, Genesis... Four, two, four, three. Really? Genesis 2, Genesis 2, 1 to 3, along with Psalm 95, are the pointed readings for uh, the uh, Sabbath meal in the evening. So they would read Psalm 95 and they would read Genesis 2, 1 to 3 as part of the last reading of the evening before the Sabbath uh, kicks off. And we'll see why that is and what that's all about here soon. So basically this, this section, verses seven to 19, was, uh, it begins with a warning uh, of the Holy Spirit to the congregation. That's verses seven through 11. That's uh, hearing about God's prohibition of hard-heartedness hard like the Israelites had in the wilderness, which is Psalm 95. And then God's judgment and punishment for hard-heartedness, which was all of that generation who left Egypt was not allowed to enter the promised land. They had to die before their children could arrive and take possession of the promised land. And then the second section, verses 12 to 19, is an application of this warning to the congregation. Uh, first, there's two instructions based on the lessons that we learned from Psalm 95 which are we are supposed to have insight and be aware of the consequences of unbelief. And then secondly, we have that need for daily mutual encouragement you know, to avoid us from being deceived by sin. So we're called not only to uh, watch our hard-heartedness, watch our unbelief, but to watch out for our brothers and sisters also so they do not succumb uh, to that, to encourage one another to remain uh, faithful. And then the reason why we have to heed those commands is then in verse 14, uh, because we are partakers of Christ through our foundation as children of God in our baptism. We need to hold on to that until the end of our lives. So that, that's why we have to 
we have to uh, listen to these commands because the consequence of not doing that is, again, falling away from the faith. And then it summarizes in verses 5 to 18, the reason for Israel's failure was their negative response to the message and the experience, God's disgust at them for their unbelief, uh, for 40 years of repeated sin. Uh, So finally, just, okay, you guys are not going out of the promised land. And then his oath of exclusion. And so all of that being dredged up again, reminding these people who are Jewish converts to Christianity, you know, everybody knows about the Exodus. Everybody knows about the wilderness wandering in the desert. So then the application of this message to these new Christians in uh, Rome are, don't forget what the consequences of unbelief are. You will not be of just as the Israelites were not allowed to enter the promised land. You will not be able to enter into the promised eternal rest in Christ, which the preacher has been talking about, this rest. Uh, that word rest just won't go away out of my head. Yeah. <laughs> we know what rest is physically. Mm-hmm. And I think by this time we understand what rest is spiritually. And the author of Hebrews is using it both ways. I'm sorry? And the author, to the, the writer to the Hebrews is using rest in both ways simultaneously. And I was Gospel Accord 9. Hmm? (laughs) Christ being fully God, fully human, Mm -hmm. attained his rest Mm -hmm. when he said it is finished. And it manifested itself at the resurrection. Did I get that right? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's a little weird applying the term rest to Christ. I mean, I mean, not that there's anything wrong with it. We talk about his rest in the tomb. Uh, but the human side is what... But yeah, he was fully, a... Fully God, fully when, human. Yeah, when he died, when all was accomplished, it, it, according to his human nature, he was able to rest. That human nature was allowed to, okay, all the suffering is over. So yes, he did get his eternal rest. So there. why not the spiritual rest? Because that he was he was both there mm-hmm. when he said it. The, the, the statement applied to both his physical and his spiritual. Sure, uh, and his, you know, and he even talked about you know my spirit is sorrowful even unto death. He said in the Garden of Gethsemane. So yeah, you could talk about his spiritual rest too. It's just I feel weird talking about Jesus having sp- needing spiritual rest when he is God, but yes, he's also a true man. So you have that those attributes are shared between the two natures because there's only one Christ. Well, he, so that's really, it's, there's nothing wrong with thinking of it like that at all. He had our nature, so we had, he had to go all the way. <laughs> yeah, and we're going to talk about that at great length in chapter 5. 4. 5, 4. Really? Yeah, ch- chapter 4. Chapter 4, we're going to get into... Uh, a direct result of his human nature being united to his divine nature uh, and why that's good for us. So yes, absolutely. Yeah, everything that we look forward to, everything that we are promised Christ experienced first. He did. So, so yes, absolutely. All right, so the big gist of this section is, the big one is, you know, don't, don't fall into temptation, don't fall away from the faith, and then, this call for mutual encouragement with each other. That's why you, a Christian can't exist in a vacuum. You know, folks that want to say, I can be, you know, I'm spiritual, not religious. I can be, I can be communing with God on my own and uh, I don't need a congregation. I don't need a church. The uh, Bible begs to differ that we are communal creatures. We are supposed to worship together for mutual aid, mutual comfort, uh, mutual encouragement. And plus, if you were just uh, hanging out on a mountaintop, communing with God by yourself, you wind up worshiping yourself Jesus in the end. Together, so. that's, that's what Gnosticism was. And I only bring that up because I'm reading a really good book about Gnosticism in America today. Uh, but that was the original, like the original heresy is that, well, you know, all that stuff in the Bible is just kind of uh, a jumble of what the actual truth was. And there's this higher state we can reach 
to really know God. And once you know God, you realize God's within you and everything about your flesh is bad. Everything spiritual is good. So this is what you need to try to attain and secret knowledge and all this nonsense. And it never goes away. Uh, that's why John wrote his gospel. One of the reasons why John wrote his gospel is a very early form of Gnosticism had already cropped up saying, you know, Jesus wasn't God. You know, he was just a spiritual dude and this is what you have to do. Uh, yeah. And that's what happens when you just dismiss the Christian community and strike out on your own. You wind up turning into a Gnostic. You wind up, okay, I'm trying to find God on my own. And the God you find is yourself. You know, inevitably throughout history. So enough about that. Uh, and another big point of this section is, you know, they're talking about apostasy is the fancy word. Apostasy is one who used to believe and then fell away. Uh, you'll particularly hear that word nowadays uh, being used by Islam because, you know, an apostate cannot be left to live uh, under a strict reading of the Quran. Uh, so if you leave the faith, you just signed your death warrant. They're going to come get you. Okay. Yeah, you can't renounce the Muslim faith. They will kill you. Right. Virginians. It was Virginians. Or there. Ham for dinner every night. <laughs> Why aren't they going to be in for shock? Get it, ham. Yeah. yeah so, so apostasy, that the the sin of falling away from the faith once you already had it, um, and the way that happens. It's not like Lucifer starting a civil war in heaven and dragging a third of the angels with him. You know, just, okay, we're going to rebel against God. We don't do that. We don't open, openly rebel against God. It starts inside here. There, there's that, that little Gnostic spark again is our apostasy, our unbelief starts right here too. Uh, and it's just little, little things internally. We don't set out to lose the faith. We don't set out to, to be at war with God, to be his enemy. But little things, little by little, and you don't see them happening, start to add up. And the next thing you know, how did I get here? Well, that's how you got there. You slowly but surely started giving things up. Uh, and you can see that in the church at large, getting on the soapbox again, with all the things in society, with our morals in decline, uh, which is cyclical. This, this constantly happens through history, too. It gets bad, it gets worse, it gets good, gooder, better. And then it gets worse again. And we're on the kind of downward slope, it seems like, again. But then when the church just says, well, yeah, we're going to let that slide because we want to we want to relate to the culture, so we want to live along with the culture, so we have to adopt what the culture is doing. And that's when you wind up with people being clergy who shouldn't be clergy and people uh, getting married that should not be married to each other and the whole nine yards and, and killing defenseless people that, that uh, don't have anybody else to stick up for. So those little things as the church, and we see that the decline in America, right? You see church bodies split over these issues. One goes a liberal and you can't tell them apart from anybody else other than the name on the front of the church. And then you have, you know, the hardcore Orthodox Christians like Missouri Synod Lutherans, like, well, Rome most of the time, Eastern Orthodoxy, some Baptists, some Methodists, some, you know, regular denominations are still faithful. Uh, and you see that division. So like every denomination has a division. You got, you know, the red side of the congregation, the blue side until they split off and, and make their own church. Nobody starts off to do that. It's like, I'm going to split the church today. These things start building up over time. Uh, and there's certain things, and you can look at patterns and see that you know, like certain things instigate. You know, like they always try to say that marijuana is the gateway drug. You start smoking pot, and the next thing you know, you're going to be doing harder drugs. Uh, you start ordaining female clergy, then these other things are going to follow right behind because it's like dominoes. These, this happens, then this happens, then this happens, and then they throw the gospel away uh, for whatever reason. So... So nobody sets out to, to become an apostate. Nobody sets out to split their church bodies in half. It just slowly declines, slowly compromises. And the next thing you know, how did we get here? How do we have 600 different Christian denominations in one little country? That's how. That's how it starts. Okay. So this section also talks about 
why were we going to talk about works? There's a reason for that. Now I can't remember what it was. Uh, we've come to share in Christ for the middle of religious confidence. Blah blah blah. For those of you, yep, 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 yep. Is um, it in four? Yeah, I think I didn't go back far enough. No, 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 no. I was talking about the next chapter. Oh, chapter four? It might be. But I've got it written for here. So oh, I don't know why. Okay. Um, There was a really good reason why I was going to do that. Because retired folks don't want to talk about work anyhow. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, the application of the congregation was unbelief is the cause of not being able to enter God's rest. Daily mutual encouragement. Wow, I have no idea... And all of a sudden, why I wrote that down. It was extremely important last week because I said, this is the first thing we're going to start with this week. And I can't remember why I did it. That's good. I even marked the place in the Book of Concord. Why? Ah, okay. Now I remember why. It is kind of a little bit of a, of a detour, but we'll go there. So, you know, the famous verse by Paul is, faith without works is dead. And they're like, okay, but our good works don't merit us anything. No, they don't. But if you have living, active faith, you are producing good works. So I was just going to blast out a little part of what the formula of Concord has to say uh, about preservation of the faith, which is the connection to this text. So Article 4 on good works in the Solid declaration of the Formula of Concord says, third, whether good works preserve salvation or whether they are necessary for preserving faith, righteousness, and salvation is another issue in dispute. This again is of high and great importance for the one who endures to the end will be saved. And that's exactly what this passage is talking about, those who endure to the end. Also, for we share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original conference firm to the end, Hebrews 3.14. We must also explain well and precisely how righteousness and salvation are preserved in us, lest salvation be lost again. And then the, art, and then the article goes on to talk about the yeah, faith is what's required for salvation, but then when you are justified by Christ's death and resurrection for you, then he sanctifies you by giving you the Holy Spirit, which makes you holy and your new saintly part of you is what produces these good works. So if you're not producing good works, you gotta ask yourself, well, you won't because you don't have any faith anymore. But you would ask yourself, oh, I'm not producing good works. I'm, I'm losing my faith. By then it's probably too late. But that's what the mutual encouragement is for. You know, if somebody is just saying that they believe and they're outright just living this life of debauchery, you know, nothing good comes out of them, then, then it's when we have the mutual encouragement to take somebody aside and go, hey, you know, I'm worried about you. Do you realize this, 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 and this? Which is not easy to do. Nobody wants to have that conversation with someone. Uh, but unfortunately at times, and it is the most loving thing we can do sometimes to somebody go, you know, I, I'm, I'm in fear of your soul. Nobody wants to try to say that to somebody. That's terrifying. Uh, because you're afraid they're just going to laugh right at you. Like, you. What? Who are you? You know, so again, that's that litmus test is like, am I, am I like producing good works? If I even have the, you know, the cognizance to ask the question, you're probably okay. I mean, none of us are good at it. You know, don't misunderstand me. But if you have the innate ability to, just, to even question that, you're probably okay. All right. And then the other thing was about election, which is always fun to talk about. Uh, And this also ties into Hebrews chapter 3. And this is uh, just a paragraph, kind of out of context. But actually, I'll back up one. So it says, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. The Spirit helps us in our weakness. 
For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words, Romans 8, 16 to 26. Then the Holy Scripture also testifies that God who has called us is faithful. So when he has begun the good work in us, he will also preserve it to the end and perfect it if we ourselves do not turn from him, but firmly hold on to the work begun to the end. He has promised his grace for this very purpose. 1 Corinthians 1, 9, Philippians 1, 6, 1 Peter 5, 10, 2 Peter 3, 9, and Hebrews 3, 2, which says... Which says, who was faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses also was faithful in all God's house. Okay, so we should concern ourselves with this revealed will of God. We should follow and diligently think about it. Through the word by which he calls us, the Holy Spirit bestows grace, power, and ability for this purpose. We should not sound the depths of God's hidden predestination, as is written in Luke, uh, and uh, but... Yeah, Lord, who, who will those who are saved be few? And Christ answers, strive to enter through the narrow door. So Luther says, but you had better follow the order of this epistle of Romans. Worry first about Christ and the gospel that you may recognize your sin and his grace. Then fight your sin as the first eight chapters here have taught. Then when you have reached the eighth chapter and are under the cross and suffering, this will teach you correctly of predestination in chapters 9, 10, and 11 and how comforting it is. Uh, so that's basically, you know, God is God began this good work in you. Our faith is in God will complete that good work He began in us in our baptism. That we have begun this life of sanctification. It will be completed when we die, and then all sin will finally be gone. Uh, but again, our, our sin of unbelief is not believing God's doing it. It's not our faith in ourselves to accomplish anything. It has nothing to do with that. Um, so that was a little detour, I guess. Okay. So now the preacher has explained to us exactly who Jesus is. He has exhorted us to hold fast to this faith in who Jesus is. And now he is going to give us another promise to hold on to, and that is the promise of entering God's eternal rest. So that begins chapter four. So chapter four, let's just do, let's just do, that's still most of the chapter. Let's do verses one through 13, that's a unit. Okay, so Hebrews chapter four. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us just as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. For we who have believed enter that rest, as he has said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again, in this passage, he said, they shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience, again, he appoints a certain day, today, saying through David so long afterward in the words already quoted, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works, as God did from his. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest, so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Okay. So what this chapter is now doing is drawing conclusions from what we already learned about Psalm 97 from the previous chapter. So remember, the book of Hebrews is a sermon. So the writer to the Hebrews is the preacher. 
he is preaching. He's preaching this sermon in this last chapter of his sermon. His text is Psalm 95. So I would encourage you to read Psalm 95. Should we read it again? We should probably read it again now. Okay, so Psalm 95. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. This is the people. This is the choir singing now. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hands are the depth of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as on the day at Massa in the wilderness, when your fathers put me to the test, now God speaking, and put me to the proof, though they had seen my work. For 40 years I loathed that generation and said, they are people who go astray in their heart, and they have not known my ways. Therefore, I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. That psalm took quite a turn. I mean, it started off with this great, you know, hymn of praise. That's actually, that's our, our liturgy for uh, Vespers, Matins, Matins. This is our big chunk of our liturgy for uh, Matins comes from this psalm directly, word for word. And all of a sudden God starts speaking. God gives a warning. And then God lets you know what happens if you don't heed the warning and the psalm ends. That's kind of a, hmm. Started off pretty, cheer, started off pretty cheerful and kind of went south. But that's exactly what the people of Israel did. They started off very grateful for having their captivity in Egypt uh, broken finally, and then they went south. You know, they, they were happy for a while, and then they uh, weren't happy with anything. Okay, that's, so... I find that uh, quite a few of the songs do that. Mm-hmm. They start out very joyfully or uh, praising God, especially some of David's psalms. He's very good at thanking God, praising God, and so on. And then in the end, why do you have all the, why are you sending all these enemies unto me? Why mm-hmm. is my life in danger? Uh, I mean, Although those it, are it little... takes away the joy of reading the psalm. Yeah, but it is. All... But that is a thing about Hebrew poetry uh, in one hand and in uh, prayer as another with, with David's psalms and them being prayers. Um, yeah, it starts off with praise of God, and then it, it's like basically whining to God, which is what God wants us to do. So it's like, yeah, to, to our ears, it sounds kind of harsh, but that's exactly what God wants, is you make your problems his problems. Lay the, have, the, have the confidence that you can lay those burdens at his feet, and he'll handle it for you. That's why the, remember when we talked about the imprecatory Psalms, where we're calling down God's wrath on our enemies, and you're like, how can we pray these? Well, the reason we pray those was because then we let all of our anger and all of our wrath and all of our judgment and our need for vengeance and justice, and we lay that at God's feet and say, you take care of this because I can't do it right. I I will never be able to do this without sinning because it's going to be vindictive. It's going to be vengeance. You know, it's not justice. I don't want justice. I want vengeance. But you are just, God, so you handle this. So you call down wrath on your enemies and say, God, you know what your will is. You handle it, and I trust you to do it right. And now I don't have to worry about it. So I can release that burden. It's like now it's God's problem in so many words. Because before you realize that, before someone teaches that to you, I had to have it taught to me. And you go, oh, that makes a whole lot more sense now because, you know, the one about like crushing the babies underfoot and all that's like, that's yikes. Why is that in the Bible? But then once they explain it, it's like, oh, okay. So you give, you give God the, you know, you give God the job of justice because you know, you can't serve justice. We can only serve vengeance. If we don't pray, if, if we don't pray what we feel, God gave us all these emotions and mm-hmm. these feelings and all that. So if we go before the throne acting like it's, you know, holier than thou, you know, he probably patting his foot and scared my God, I wish he'd hurry up and get on with that and get, and, get, and get to the good stuff, you mm-hmm. know. Get to the good stuff where we can really just really rail. And David has, uh, like Mary Lou was saying, you know, he has a way of, you know, just yeah. 
not only did he want punishment for them, he wanted for their children, you know, get several of their children. children. I mean, look at what Nathan came up came to him and goes, tells him the story about the dude with the sheep. Mm-hmm. And and Dave's like, oh yeah, he need to do this and he need to do that. You got to go like way over the top. And then Nathan goes, yeah, that's you, dummy. And he's like, oh, <laughs> okay. That changes everything. It's like, oh yeah, he did. This, that guy, you know, killed that sheep. You need to take like a hundred of his sheep. You know, whatever. Yeah, so, so David has yeah, a master of that. Okay, so back to, to chapter four. So now we're going to get the foretaste of what eternal rest is going to be. But first we have to get three conclusions out of Psalm 95 that we just heard that the preacher is going to walk us through. Okay, so again, the book of Hebrews is a sermon. The author is the preacher. And the key to the preachers using Psalm 95 is, keep in mind, okay, Hebrews is a sermon, right? So it is going to be given in the liturgical setting of a congregation. And also Psalm 95 is a liturgical prayer, liturgical psalm. Uh, It was one to be used in worship. Uh, either in, or actually, yes, we'll get to this a little later, but that uh, Psalm 95, along with Genesis uh, 2, 1 to 3, was read at the end of the uh, scripture reading at the end of a uh, Sabbath meal. But when that Sabbath coincided with a festival day and everybody goes to the, one of the big days when everybody goes to the, the temple in Jerusalem together and do the meal and the sacrifices, they also read those same things. Uh, So it's in the context of liturgy, either at the temple or at home with the head of the household and his family uh, as a devotion. So Psalm 95, liturgical. Hebrews, the book itself, liturgical because it's a sermon that will be in the context of the liturgy of the church. Okay. Now... In verse one of chapter four, you know, therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. So there's that that word we love, fear of God. And you have to learn it in catechism. And then you think you understand it. And the pastor explains it to you and you think you got it. And then 20 years go by and 30 years go by and you have to teach it to somebody and try to explain to them what fear of God means. And you think you do a good job and the kids seem to think they understand it. And now if I ask you what does fear of God mean, we're all going to go, I know what it is, but I can't put it into words. (laughs) It's just one of those things. I mean, am I supposed to be afraid of God? No. Yes. Yes and no. It's complicated. Like, okay, so an appeal in this first verse, and we'll come back to fear. An appeal to fear faithlessness by recalling what happened to that Exodus generation, right? They were excluded from entry in the promised land. And look at how, what the way the preacher did it. He says, let us fear us, not you, which is, one of, which is a homiletical device that we do sometimes. Sometimes if we're making a real point, I will say you, but more often I will try to say we because I'm included in something I'm cautioning us about. You know, we all need to be aware of whatever sin the text is warning us against. So we'll say we, our, but sometimes for a rhetorical point, I'll say you, which means all of us, but you, when you hear it, tends to think of just me. So when I hear it, I think just me, he's talking to just me. Uh, It's rhetorical advice. Here the preacher uses, let us fear. So he's including himself. And the fun thing about the word fear in Greek is it has a broader meaning than it does in English. So you would have to like write a couple more sentences to unpack it, but then it makes it unreadable. So the word is correctly translated as fear, but what does the word fear mean in Greek? It means uh, not just the emotion, right? When we're afraid of dying, we're afraid of our life ending and what that's going to be like. When we're afraid... 
to go to the doctor because we don't want to know what the test result's going to be. You know, that's an emotional fear. But in Greek, the, the word fear isn't just the emotion. It's much broader. It's an active expression. Uh, so it is, uh, someone a lot smarter than me called it an expression of prudent foresight and sensible caution. Like, well, them fancy words, what does that mean? Yeah, you have to, you got to read it a couple times, but it's the fear is an active expression of your, your fear of God is to heed the warnings. Okay, don't fall away. Don't, whatever he told me not to do, he told us, oh, don't, don't lose the promise of entering this rest. So he's going to tell me how not to do that. So I'm going to make sure I don't do those things. So I'm going to be prudent. I'm going to think ahead that I don't want to fall into this trap. So it's not fear, I'm afraid of the repercussions. It's a yes, I'm afraid of what the consequence of this will be. And I'm actively actively living to not let that happen. It's kind of a reverence, a reverence fear. It's like when your mother, you, you do something, you say, my mother's going to kill me. You know she's not going to kill you. Mm-hmm. But you, you don't want the punishment either. You right, know? right. So you don't fear her for the, what actually could happen. <laughs> she could mm-hmm. kill you, but you won't. And so that, I just think it's as a reverent fear, you know, is respectful reverent yeah. fear. Yeah, so fear isn't being scared. Fear is being adult about things, really, in a way, mature about things. Is okay, God's giving you all the warnings. I'm reading the warnings. You can't say I haven't been warned. You can't say I haven't been told. I should be active in my, actively going out and trying not to do these things. And when I do them, Repent, seek the mutual kind, you know, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The mutual of everybody else in church. What's the word I'm trying to find? Wow. Consent? Uh, uh, mutual consolation, mutual support, yeah, of ever everybody. You know, that's why you can't be a, a solitary Christian, why you need this support system, because we are supposed to help each other. And reverent fear is also attached to obedience. Mm-hmm. And that's right, exactly. And that's what this is talking about. And so this is telling us to be obedient, not because it gains us anything, but because the consequences are bad. Because the only choice we can make is the wrong choice. So, and then, therefore, with the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear, lest any of you should seem. To have failed to reach it. So it's not just so that you and me, but what about this guy over here? I'm 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 gonna look out for him too. So it's not just this prudent foresight and sensible caution uh, on our own part, but because we have the fear of someone being left behind. Okay, we're all looking to strive toward the finish line, as Paul says, to run the race, right? To re- receive the crown. And we're all running this race together. We're all going for the same prize that Christ has won for us, this eternal rest. And we should be terrified that someone next to us stumbles and doesn't come with us. So it's the fear of leaving someone behind because their loss from the kingdom of God is also our loss as the visible church on earth. So here's someone that we could have encouraged, could have given some words of gospel to, and we don't, and they become lost, not putting their salvation on us, that responsibility, but failing to bring them along with us in this fear of God, fear of what what we're striving for, that should terrify us that we don't want that brother or sister left to the side, left behind, because if they're left behind, they're a loss to our congregation, to our group. That's what happens when we leave people behind or we lose track of people, which is you know, a dilemma a lot of people struggle with, uh, particularly clergy when you can't get a hold of people or whatever. But So their loss is also our loss. We should feel that loss deeply that we, we do not want somebody left behind, especially someone that's already a member of the community. And we just ignore them, even though we know they're struggling. You're like, yeah, that's not cool. 
And then also someone in, that you encounter every day and you don't ever share the gospel with them. Yeah, if they don't want to hear it, that's different. But if you know they're receptive and you're just being a little chicken, well, maybe you need to pray about that to have someone bring the gospel to them, even if it's not you. You know, I'm not making a list. This is not law. This is not legalism. This is not a list of things you got to do. But it's a list of things you got to do uh, that you get to do is the way to say it. So there, that other, that's the other connotation of this fear is that we don't leave someone behind. Again, community. And we've been talking about that since verse one, chapter one, verse one in this book. You know, this is all about the congregation. It's the preacher having a conversation with the congregation. All right, so the preacher and his congregation are fellow sojourners to this promised rest. Doesn't want to leave anyone behind. So there in verse two, hearers with hardened hearts don't receive the benefit that the words promised. So is it up to us to soften somebody's heart? Yes and no. You know, the spirit works when and where he will. He wills. So the spirit is going to work on that hardened heart. And how does he do that? Well, how does God do anything in this world? Through us, because we're his hands and eyes and ears and feet. Okay, so that is how God manifests in the world today through our neighbors, our vocations, our many vocations as neighbors to the world. So, so no, it's not our ultimate responsibility to save souls because we never know. You would never know anyway. You may me, can have pretty good ideas sometimes, but you don't know and it's not your business. It's not your job. Your job is to share the gospel either by word or by deed, where someone looks at you and goes, what is different about you? Well, let me tell you about Jesus, okay? So these hearers with the hardened heart, they do not receive the benefit. Now you see where the conclusions we're gonna start drawing from that, the preacher is gonna draw from that Psalm because what did the Psalm talk about? What happened to the Israelites who had hard hearts, right? They, they all had to die. They weren't allowed to enter the promised land. So that's where the preacher is gonna be going now. He's applying the, uh, the points that Psalm 95 made as his text. Now he's explaining it. So then here in verses three to five, uh, for we who have believed enter that rest. Okay, we got that. As he said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, the Israelites. Although his works were finished from the foundation of the world, for he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again, in this passage, he said, they shall not enter my rest. Okay, so since this congregation, again, no solitary Christians, this congregation as a group received the word in faith. Okay, so they had ears of faith. The Holy Spirit is letting that penetrate their brain. Okay, they received the benefit of the word. All right, so the promised rest is going to be two different things. Uh, again, this is going to be that concept of the now and the not yet. Okay, the promised rest is God's primordial place, they call it. It is the, uh, it's not the temple. It's not the promised land. Okay, it's an eschatolo es es eschatological goal. Eschatology is the study of the end times. So the eschaton is the last day. So it is a... a uh, Eschatological goal, meaning um, the goal, the prize is on the last day. But we do get some of that benefit now. So that's the not yet. You have to wait till we die to get that part. But you do get benefits of that in the now. And the hearers are entering into that promised rest now because the promise is for today. And where does he say today? Yeah, verse seven. Again, he appoints a certain day, today, saying through David so long afterward, and the words are already quoted, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Okay. So the promise is for today and not yet. So there's, there's a promise now and a promise not yet. It's the same promise. You get the full realization when we go to heaven or Jesus comes back. And, but you also get this benefit today, which is you can enter the time and place of God's rest in guess where? So where can we enter 
into God's promised rest today, not literally today, say Sunday, right? So you enter church as a community in the divine service, then you have entered into God's place of rest, place and time of rest. Why is that capitalized? What's that? Today. Today? Capitalized. Um, sometimes, maybe sometimes. In verse seven, seven. Mm-hmm. Uh, when it's indented, because it, it's the beginning of the sentence, mm-hmm. or it's the beginning of the verse. It's quoting. Um, oh, well, no, mine's in the middle. Hmm? He again fixes a certain day, comma, in quotes, today, capital T, mm-hmm. comma. Saying to David after uh, after so long a time, just as he had been said before, and then today mm-hmm. you know his voice. Mm-hmm. Yep. Now, yep, because that's, that's a direct quote from Psalm 95. Oh, that's why today's... Yep, yep, that, and that's, that's why it's indented like that. Yeah, yeah, that's all from Psalm 95. So he's still not, the preacher's still not done quoting it. <laughs> well, you know how it works. You got to tell him, and then you got to tell him what you told him. That's exactly what this guy's doing. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So that's that's where today applies today you know that that's the now all right so we under that time and place of rest in the divine service because that's where we go and we hear the gospel and we believe it i mean we believe the gospel when we leave this place but this is where we come to hear it to hear it proclaimed and we hear and believe the gospel and then we have access to that heavenly sanctuary right because again that's where heaven comes to earth outside of time and space Heaven comes to earth in the divine service, in the proclamation of the gospel, in baptism, in the Lord's Supper. That is where heaven comes to us, where the the promised rest, we get a taste of it, a foretaste of what it's going to be like. Okay? So we have access to where we are already, by faith, are at rest with God. But not yet. Okay? And that goes back to Genesis 2, 1 to 3 now. Which again, these are the verses they read at the end of the meal. And then if it's on a, if the Sabbath meal is on a high holy day, they do it at the temple. So, Genesis 2. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that all that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it, God rested from all his work that he had done. They had to say it three times. So it must be important. That that's when God rested from all that he had done. Of course, there's three persons resting. Might be a Trinity thing. Could be. Um, yeah. So again, This preacher to the Hebrews, to the Hebrew Christians in Rome, is following that Jewish tradition of reciting Psalm 95, followed by Genesis 2, 1 to 3, which would be in the synagogue at the onset of the Sabbath. So God's rest is both that primordial seventh day of creation, the day when God rested from all his labors, and which transcends time and space, because it's where God is, and the as cap as every time I try to say the last day, the eternal last day that has already been inaugurated. So the end times were inaugurated when Christ rose from the dead. So the end times are started, and when they actually end, that will be the eschaton. That will be the last day. Okay. So that was a lot. So that's what it means to, to enter into God's eternal rest. We, we fully enter when we die, but we get to like kind of almost peek through the curtain a little bit in the divine service when heaven comes to us and God comes to serve us. Questions? It's really, the structure of this book is really cool because there's just layers upon layers upon layers upon layers of stuff that, you know, has to be on purpose. There is no way that that would just happen accidentally. Now, this is all all on purpose, all these levels within levels. Now, talking about the book, and we know there were, what, 40-some authors, right? Of the Bible? Yes. 
Okay. How many of them were what we would call well educated? Hmm. Paul. Well, I know Paul for sure was extremely highly educated. He was Pharisee of Pharisees. Matthew, because he was a physician. Yeah, Matthew had to have been pretty well educated to be a tax collector. Tax collector. Because he had to have his figures. Um, and Luke. And physician. Luke being a physician, sure. Yeah. So Mark is the only question mark out of the four evangelists. Because like, is Mark? Well, what I'm what I'm getting at is, you just said that there's layer upon layer upon layer upon layer. Yeah. Uh, in the Bible, and so the gentleman who wrote it had to have some literary skill. Oh, sure. To be able to put it together, so yeah, that, absolutely. I mean, God was in the Holy Spirit oh, right, right there, right. Uh, but the words came from the. I'm sure God didn't print everything. Yeah, I mean, because that's. Mind. That's what's so beautiful about it is, is because, you know, the, the intricacy and the interweaving of everything in Scripture obviously is the hand of God. It's the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But then each author's personalities come yes. through. And that's, you know, that's a wonderful thing. You know, so that's why you, if you just throw out random pieces of Gospels, you would be able to, with a little bit of study, go, yeah, that's from Mark and that's from Luke and that's from Matthew and that's from John. You would just know it because of the style. Uh, and there's no doubt about that. Absolutely. But the writers, I feel, had to have some education, mm -hmm. uh, even if it was in their younger years. Oh, yeah. When they were a child. Yeah, I don't subscribe to the thing where they say, oh, well, you know, these fishermen from Galilee were illiterate. Eh, that's probably a bit of a stretch. You know, was Peter illiterate? Well, he owned a business. I mean, he wasn't just a fisherman. He owned a fishing business. So he wasn't an idiot. Um, I don't know. I mean, he was an idiot for other reasons, but that's why we love him. Uh, yeah, so you, so you see that, you know, very much come through in the writing, that they have to have some kind of literary time. Like Luke absolutely did for, you know, for a doctor who's, I imagine back then you couldn't read the writing either. Uh, but he had this ability to, and he never hit it. He just said, okay, I'm going to put this first. This is what I think is where Jesus, this is where I'm going to start the story of Jesus, the sermon in Nazareth. That's not the first thing Jesus did in his ministry, and he didn't say it is, but it's the first thing Luke puts in his gospel to bring it, the first thing he has Jesus do in his ministry, in his gospel. And he says, as was Jesus' custom on the Sabbath, he was in the synagogue, in Nazareth this time and did this and this happened and they tried to throw him off a cliff and that probably happened elsewhere too so he, he put these events and he put them together in an order to make theological points which tracks all the way through the gospel you can outline that book till you're blue in the face it's it's remarkable all the stuff that's going on in there uh, and then John's gospel is just weird and beautiful because it is what it is and then Matthew is just very systematic because he's writing to Jewish converts. So it's I didn't get, get a soundtrack from Hebrews, but uh, this writer also mm -hmm. had to be trained in some educational... Oh, well, I mean, like this author here, he is a pastor, for sure. So we know... He had some educational... Oh, absolutely. He's a, he's a rabbi. Or if he, he was a rabbi before he was... Uh, right. A, a pastor, a Christian pastor, I'm, I'm sure, uh, just because of his knowledge of Hebraic thought and, and everything else he's doing. Um, yes. And I'll, yeah, did you, were you here for when we did the very beginning trying to figure out who wrote Hebrews? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So really we have all these, we have all these theories, but the one I like the best is Clement and Clement's first epistle. Clement is an apostolic father. So he's uh, someone who came along immediately after the apostles wrote scripture and then he came along and he's like the next generation after the apostles and his first epistle and the book of Hebrews are like this point by point for point all the way through it can't be a coincidence uh, so that's who I actually think wrote it I, so he was absolutely very well educated yeah so that's yeah so this is this is quite the work you know there's a lot I always say there's a lot in Hebrews because it seems like every verse has 
something important to tell us, and they do. There's just so much in this little book, and it's not that long. There's just a lot packed in there. So yeah, and and inspiration, of the Holy Spirit helps too, <laughs> definitely. Okay, so we have this active, uh, this active. Uh, that's why I was talking about works. I jumped the gun on this stuff from the Book of Concord. Anyway, all right. So this place of rest is open to all believers now. You know, all believers come to the divine service and receive the means of grace. That is where we get a foretaste of the great rest awaiting us. Um, and it's left for all of God's people. Now, because Jesus entered into God's place of rest by his entry into the heavenly sanctuary, by his taking his seat at the right hand of God, his followers are now promised that we can enter that too. And now the preacher does something kind of neat. And again, it's one of those things you, you're not going to get it from English, but he invents a word. And he invents this word called uh, uh, sabbatismos. Sabbatismos means Sabbath celebration, but this word is never used anyplace else except here. He invented this word. And the reason he did that is to distinguish this eternal rest that he's talking about from that Old Testament Sabbath observance that we just talked about. You know, where you, you observe the Sabbath, that's your day of rest. That's when you go to synagogue. That's when we, we hear all this. And he is making a distinction between that. So he makes up a word specific to this event he's talking about, which is Sabbath celebration, celebrating God's Sabbath, the day he rested from his labors, the day he comes to us and gives us his gifts. So which... Translation is that word used in? Greek, the original language. Pardon? The original language. Oh, just yeah. in the Greek. Yeah. It's not. Yeah, so how does that translate? It's verse 9. Uh, what do they call it in ESV? Just say Sabbath. Yeah, just says Sabbath rest. Yeah, Sabbath rest. Better translation is uh, Sabbath celebration. But yeah, so that word is, is unique. And it's unique to this writer uh, because he's making a point. And it's basically, it's just a compound word because uh, sabaton is Sabbath. So we just did what the Germans do. You want to make a new word, you clunk two words together. And there you go, got a new word. And if you want to make that word, then they keep adding them together and the words keep getting longer and longer. Uh, and so that's all he did. He just compounded these two words together. And uh, sabaton is actually a loan word from Hebrew. So basically they spell it in Greek letters, but that's what the word is in Hebrew. And then he makes a new compound word and goes, That's what this is what I'm talking about, Sabbath celebration. And that's to distinguish our eternal rest from these Old Testament Sabbath observances, which you can look at Leviticus uh, 23, uh, to see the special Sabbaths on a festival when there's pilgrim days at the temple, like we talked about, when they do all this stuff special for that. Um, and this is to point out that our eternal rest is on a way higher level and scale than that celebration. So that's why he makes up a new word. Okay, and then Isaiah prophesied about the new Zion that would replace the temple in the new heavens and the new earth. And we can look at that next week. Uh, Isaiah 66, a little bit in 65, Isaiah 66, and... Uh, I think that's the Old Testament reading for the last Sunday of the church here. Isaiah 66. Anyway, uh, so we'll look at that and uh, we will see what Isaiah is prophesying about. And then, of course, John in his revelation showed us the new Jerusalem descending from the heavens. And in it, there was no temple because Jesus is our temple. So we don't have need of a temple. And then you're going to see that connection get made. Uh, and then we will look at Psalm 92, which was the psalm appointed for uh, the Sabbath readings uh, during the time of the second temple. So this time in the New Testament where we're at now. So during the second temple period, the uh, communal celebration around the Sabbath in the temple, Psalm 92. And then that's where, we'll, that's where we'll wrap it up tonight because we have to spend some time in the Old Testament next week. Good stuff.
questions? It's getting interesting. It's getting really interesting. And then when we finish, when we finish chapter four, chapter four. Yeah, the tail end of chapter four is the big transition. So it's going to end kind of the prologue of this sermon. This has all been building up to get to the point. If you just can't believe that. Uh, so this is all building up, like this is all the preliminary stuff, and then the preacher is going to get down to business in chapter five, if you could believe that. Uh, so yeah, this is it's accelerating. It's getting more interesting, getting more intense. Uh, there's going to be another warning against apostasy. We're going to talk about Melchizedek for like two chapters. Whole chapter, we're going to talk about Melchizedek. And then a lot of the themes that we've already seen are going to come back now. So we, like I said, this has been prologue. So the, the preacher's thrown out a lot of stuff at us, talking about uh, covenants and how we're priests with Christ, and you know, we're brothers with Christ. And, you know, this is what the priestly folks had to do to make satisfaction for their sins before they did it for the people. And this is what we did with sacrifices for sin offerings and, and the Day of Atonement and the scapegoat and blah, 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 blah. And now they're going to unpack a lot of that stuff in the rest of the book, expand it, uh, get to the nitty gritty of it. Uh, so it gets really interesting from here. Hebrews is a really neat book. You know, it's not that long, but it's got a ton of stuff in it. Yeah. And a lot of a lot of Old Testament stuff, of course, makes sense if you're writing to a a church of Jewish converts that they would understand all this stuff where we don't anymore necessarily. So we got to go back and read about some of that stuff. So that's where we'll call it quits tonight.